Today I'd like to talk about something near and dear to all of us, and that is food. Uh, looking, <laughs> very, very crucial to all of us, yes. Uh, looking back, late 2007, early to mid-2008, you could look around the globe and see the start of food riots, food unrest, as food prices were going up. How it manifested itself ranged from Egypt conscripting soldiers to bake bread that was subsidized for people. People would stand in line for hours waiting for the government subsidized bread, getting in fights, and riots were breaking out all the way. In Mexico, there were tortilla protests. In Indonesia, 10,000 people took to the streets of Jakarta to protest the government after tempeh prices based on soybeans uh, started to skyrocket. In Thailand, farmers had to guard their fields at night with shotguns, lest their ripening rice was stolen right out from under them. The government response to the food price hikes started out in exporting countries. In order to keep domestic food prices down, we saw countries like Argentina, Russia, Vietnam, major grain exporters restrict or ban exports entirely. Yet, of course, this only served to exacerbate the problem. And as importing countries realized that they might have trouble accessing their food supplies, they started to try to undertake bilateral agreements to secure access to food supplies. So we saw the Philippines, a leading rice importer, go to Vietnam to try to secure a three-year agreement to import 1.5 million tons of rice each year. Yemen sent a delegation to Australia to try to secure wheat supplies. Egypt went to Russia, also looking for wheat. Yet at a time when it was certainly a seller's market, these countries were having a difficult time making sure that they could secure imports of food for their people. So then there was a next wave of response. And, these, and we've seen food riots before, we've seen bilateral agreements before, but this next wave of response was something new. And that was more and more countries that import food supplies have started to look overseas beyond their borders. South Korea went into the Sudan looking for 1.7 million acres to grow wheat. Um, in comparison, South Korea rice land area at home is about three quarters of the size of this area they were renting in the Sudan. One of the negotiations that made national news was when South Korea company Daewoo went into Madagascar. They were looking to lease an area about half the size of Belgium to grow food and crops for, for biofuels. This provoked such unrest that, that it led to a changeover of the government of Madagascar and a cancellation of the deal. China, uh, of course, with the world's largest population, has some of the most massive farming abroad attempts and agreements. A couple of years ago, China went to the Philippines and signed a memorandum of understanding to lease an area equal to one-tenth the size of the Philippines' rice land. In this case, word got out to farmers who protested uh, neo-colonialism, and the agreement was canceled. But China has agreements in, in a number of other countries um, one of the largest ones is, is in the D Democratic Republic of the Congo, where China will be farming almost 7 million acres of land for crops, including palm oil, which can be used for food, but also will be used for biofuels for transportation. Ironically enough, where they're doing this farming in the Democratic Republic of Congo um, is also a country that's on the recipient list of the World Food Program for food donation supplies. Sudan, where a number of these agreements are taking place, is also the World Food Program's largest recipient of food, food donations. And there are about 50 or so of these agreements uh, around the world, yet they're hard to track because there's no real coordination, there's no real registry. Um, not too many people are looking at this issue. 
uh, the World Food and Agriculture Organization of the United Nations has started to look into it as a serious security issue. Um, some NGOs like the International Food Policy Research Institute are starting to look at it. So this is the backdrop situation. Food prices now have gone down from their record high levels of a year ago, yet they're still well above long-term averages. And many people are concerned because hunger was one of the areas the world had been making progress. After World War II, the number of hungry people in the world was starting to drop. In the mid-90s, it hit about 825 million of us were suffering from hunger. But now, that trend has reversed itself. And in 2009, over 1 billion of humanity is suffering from hunger. The world has seen food prices spike before, but all of these price spikes were temporary. They were the result of a one-year crop, crop shortfall because of weather or because of, of countries going to buy more grain. But now the situation is different because these recent rises in food prices are the product of several long-term trends in supply and demand. On the demand side, we have each year 79 million more people coming to the dinner table, more and more people looking to consume grain-intensive livestock products. And in the last several years, we've seen an increased push to turn food into fuel for cars, largely in the United States with our ethanol industry that's based on corn. This year, about one quarter of the US corn crop will be going to fuel for cars. The US supplies about two thirds of the corn that's traded on world markets, so this does have an effect outside of our borders. Now looking forward, uh, on the supply side, yields of crops are still going up each year, but the additional gains in yields are starting to slow. Soil erosion is hampering crop production in many of the world's areas. Water shortages are worsening, whether it's from overpumping of underground aquifers, which is largely an invisible problem, but, but is some of the most dangerous uh, water overuse that we see. Data from the World Bank show that 175 million Indians are now fed with grain produced from overpumped water. When those wells start to go dry, 175 million people will be looking for a new food supply. The comparable number for China looks to be about 130 million people as wells are overpumped and water tables are starting to fall. And these problems I'm mentioning are happening now, before we've seen the worst that climate change can bring. What climate change will do to food, on top of this background of long-term trends, frankly, it's scary. You don't need to look too much farther than ice melting to see that we're in trouble. When we look at accelerating melting on Greenland, for instance, which is very much affected by the melting of the Arctic sea ice we heard before. Uh, when the Arctic is covered with, with ice, that white ice reflects the sunlight very well. If that ice disappears in sunlight, those dark waters can absorb much more sunlight, heating up the local area where Greenland is right nearby. And Greenland contains enough water to raise sea levels by 23 feet. Now, none of this will happen overnight, but the trends are, are showing. Each new report from the scientific community shows that melting is happening much faster than we had anticipated. It's outpacing any of our scientific models. If anybody read the 2007 report from the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, the world body of some 2,500 2, scientists, uh, their projections were that we could see temperature rises up to 10 degrees this century. We could see close to one meter sea level rise this century. And right now, our global warming 
carbon emissions are outpacing their projections, our temperature rises are outpacing our project their projections, and our ice melting is outpacing their projections. With the glacier melt we heard about that supplies the major rivers of Asia, once these rivers disappear, and rivers like the Yellow, Yangtze, Mekong, Ganges, Brahmaputra, Indus, if they lose part of their dry season flow, we're disrupting the food supply of well over one billion people. Together, these show us that climate change certainly is a security issue because when these one billion hungry people <laughs> turn to, to get food, where are they going to get it from? The United States, of course, can no longer say, well, we're going to keep all our food to ourselves, we're not going to export any, because frankly, China is now our banker. And if they started to come into the world market in a major way, which they have not before for, for stapled grains, uh, we'll be in an entirely new food economy. We'll be seeing a new geopolitics of food scarcity start to emerge. Uh, there's one, one more crucial way that, that climate change affects our food supply, and that's with crop yields. If anybody's ever been in a cornfield uh, during a heat wave, you can pretty much see how the crop is devastated very quickly. On an ear of corn, each one of those, those tassels, pollen needs to travel down it to, to, to make each corn kernel. Of course, if it's desiccated and dry because of a heat wave, fertilization stops. Scientists estimate that the general rule of thumb is with each one degree rise Celsius above the optimum during the growing season of our major food crops, wheat, rice, and corn, crop yields fall by 10%. So all these together show us that next month's conferences in Copenhagen about climate change really are about food security. And food security is really about human security. But the pathway doesn't have to move this direction. And that is why we, with uh, my colleague and Earth Policy Institute president, we've developed Plan B. Plan B, which Lester Brown calls a plan, a mobilization to save civilization, has four main components. Number one is to stabilize population levels, because with ever increasing population, and 200 million women without access to family planning, uh, we won't be able to meet the world's, the needs of all these new people coming into the world. Number two, eradicate poverty. Number three, restore the Earth's damaged ecosystems. And number four is to stabilize climate. I'd like to go into a little detail about our plan to stabilize climate because we approach this a little bit differently than some of my, my colleagues back in Washington, D.C. In Washington, D.C., when people talk about climate change, the question is always, what is politically possible? What bill can we get passed? What can we, what can we get through? What do politics say is going to work? Well, we approached the question a little bit differently. We didn't say, what is politically feasible, we said, what is necessary? What does the world need to give us the best chance of averting dangerous climate change? And thus we set our goal at the very ambitious level of, of cutting carbon emissions 80% by 2020. That's in 10 years. 2020, not 2050. 2050 is very politically easy to agree to because how many of our politicians are going to be accountable in 2050 when we see if we got there? We need an ambitious, immediate, wartime type mobilization to cut our carbon emissions very quickly to give us the best chance of saving some of these larger glaciers and the major ice sheets, preventing waves of climate refugees and migrants, and securing our food supply. The three components of the Plan B Climate Action Plan are number one, 
preserve the world's forests. 20% or so of emissions come from deforestation. We need to take care of our forests for many reasons, including stabilizing soils, biodiversity, um, but importantly for all of us, climate reasons. We need to mobilize and plant billions of trees on degraded areas to restore those soils and start to soak up more of the carbon. The second component is energy efficiency. Energy efficiency is beautiful and easy because it's something that saves us all, all money. Uh, the national government organizations like the McKinsey uh, have done studies showing that we can make enormous gains in efficiency, um, save a lot of money, and, and put ourselves in a, in a basic place. So many people want to know, what can I do? What can I do personally? Um, and, and for many people, the easy answer is, well, change your light bulb. And for a while, I thought, well, changing light bulbs is great, but we really need to change politicians to get them to do what we need to do. Uh, but then we crunched the numbers on the light bulb thing, and we found that you still need to go ahead and change your light bulbs, because if everybody around the world did change to the most efficient lighting available now, not even the high-cost LED lights that can cut electricity use by 90%, but just compact fluorescent bulbs, uh, that can cut energy use by three quarters. If everybody around the world did that, we could save enough energy to close the equivalent of 700 of the world's 2,400 coal-fired power plants. So that's your homework, number one. <laughs> then we can go ahead and, and change the politicians and make sure they know what, what's important. But, but lighting um, can make enormous gains. Similar gains can be made with appliance efficiency standards. It's amazing these new uh, plasma televisions that use more energy than, an, an, than a refrigerator. California's been trying to tighten their appliance efficiency standards, and the, and the last government had been stopping them from doing so. We need to let states have a race to be the most efficient, to have the best appliances. Uh, because together, lighting, appliances, buildings, buildings which consume about 40, are, are responsible for about 40% of the carbon emissions in the United States, we can retrofit our buildings and cut their energy use by 20% or 50% or even more. Uh, we need to redesign our transportation system so that people can walk to get around or have easier ways to mobilize themselves in the private automobile. The car won't be going away, but people need options. Altogether, our efficiency measures in lighting, appliances, transportation, city design allow the world to hold carbon emissions flat till 2020. This is allowing for some, some development uh, in, in developing countries that are still moving forward, but we found that we can, we can end up holding those emissions flat instead of having them raise up. Then, to make the last bit of cuts, we turn to renewable energy. And renewables are one area that is moving incredibly rapidly, even with the economic crisis. Projects are slowed down a bit, but they're still going forward. And who's leading the way but China? Uh, it's, it's very popular to point, point a finger at China and saying they're building a new coal-fired plant every week or two. But China is also building some of the most, the biggest wind farms we have ever heard about. Uh, Wind, wind is, is so attractive because it's abundant. Every country has it. It's widely distributed. It's climate neutral, and it's increasingly cheap. The plan B goal for wind is to develop 3 million megawatts by 2020. That would entail building about 1.5 million wind turbines over that time period. 1.5 million wind turbines sounds like a lot until you think about the world now produces about 65 million automobiles each year. Sure, cars are a bit smaller, but, but wind, wind turbines are in some ways quite a bit simpler. And, and some of the greatest success stories are, are when we see idled automobile plants that have been shut down being retrofitted and turned into wind turbine producing plants. Uh, and, and hopefully, as much as possible, that will be happening here 
in this country. Uh, you might have heard in the news about this new wind project being built in Texas. Texas, by the way, is the US number one producer of wind-generated electricity uh, in this country, which uh, you, can drive, you can drive through areas where you see wind, windmills turning and oil wells pumping. But if you go back in 10 years, those oil wells won't be pumping anymore, but those wind turbines can still be turning. Uh, with some of the new projects, however, we're using Chinese-made wind turbines because we have not supported our industry here at home. With solar, the U.S. also invented the solar cell in Bell Labs in New Jersey. Yet if you want to buy solar cells, you're more likely to buy them from China or Japan than, than here in the U.S. The good news about photovoltaics is costs are dropping incredibly rapidly. We can cover up our rooftops, no roof left behind. Every roof should have solar panels, solar water, heaters, or a green roof so that you're growing food or plants to help with water runoff problems. Uh, in China, there are 27 million homes right now that have solar water heaters. Uh, solar thermal power plants are also moving very quickly. This is not, instead of photovoltaic cells that convert sunlight directly into electricity, solar thermal power plants use mirrors to concentrate sunlight into a, a fluid-filled vessel where you make steam to drive a turbine. Uh, we have several of these projects and we have for years out in California and Nevada, but the industry is starting to revise. Right now, Algeria is planning a massive solar thermal project of 6,000 megawatts. Uh, a consortium of companies like Siemens, uh, Munich Re in Germany, they all got together and announced in July of this year the Desert Tech proposal where they're going to build massive solar thermal installations across the desert of North Africa to supply local power and to transmit it in undersea lines to Europe. They conservatively estimate that this could supply 15% of Europe's electricity, though some economic analyses have said that up to half of Europe's electricity can come from these projects in the desert. And Desert Tech has recently said that this could, the start of power transmission can be as soon as 2015. Geothermal is also moving pretty quickly. Right now, about 25% of the Philippines' population gets their power from geothermal plants. In Indonesia, Pertamina, the state oil company, has realized their oil prospects are pretty dim, so they're starting to look for that geothermal energy from the earth uh, because they realize that's where the future is. So the key to getting these renewables to go move even faster is to get the market to tell the truth. Right now, burning carbon and emitting carbon is incredibly cheap. So what we propose is what some have called, including Al Gore, I don't think he was the first to say this, but we should tax what we burn, not what we earn. So we're envisioning a tax restructuring where there's a price on emitting carbon, but then that can be returned to people in terms of lowered taxes on income. We like labor, we want more of it, so let's tax less of it. We don't like carbon emissions, let's put a price on that to, to move it closer to the true price. When you go to the gas station and you buy a gallon of gasoline, you're paying nowhere near the true cost of burning that gallon of gasoline. If you're paying three dollars or so at the pump, if you were to add on the cost of treating respiratory ailments from breathing the air pollution or uh, the climate-related impacts of those carbon emissions from burning that gasoline, uh, not even including all the security implications of defending our supply of oil, the real cost would be, would be some $12 higher. So we're not even anywhere near the true cost. We don't say we need to put that, that price on right away. Um, and to put it into perspective, if you look at Europe, uh, where they pay six or seven dollars per gallon equivalent of gasoline, um, that correlates to a price on carbon of about $1,800 per ton of carbon. 
we're not going up anywhere near that high. We're proposing an, a carbon tax introduced at about $20 per ton of carbon, ratcheted up to about $200 per ton of carbon by 2020. This would be a carbon tax that would be paid uh, at the wellheads or at the mines, um, but it would permeate the entire fossil fuel economy. Then you couple that with tax restructuring uh, so that it's non-regressive, money goes back to people, and uh, we have a win for all of us and the markets start to tell the truth. Because if there's anything we've learned in the last couple of years, leaving costs off the books doesn't work. So you can look at it. It didn't work for Enron. It's probably not going to work for the, for the global economy. And just to show that, that all these ambitious plans can happen, we sometimes try to look for historical precedents. And I find myself reading again and again the State of the Union Address from 1942, when President Roosevelt stood before the nation one month after the bombing of Pearl Harbor and he announced the nation's armed production goals. And he said, we will be producing 45,000 tanks, 60,000 planes, 20,000 anti-aircraft guns, 6 million tons of merchant sh shipping capacity. And no one in the world had ever heard such incredibly ambitious goals. Roosevelt called into his office the heads of the US auto manufacturers and said, you're going to help us meet these goals. And they said, of course, Mr. President, we will do what we can. You know, it'll be a little tough making the cars and all this, but we're, gonna, we're behind the effort. And he says, you don't understand. You know, no more cars. We are putting everything into this wartime mobilization effort. And indeed, during two to three years during the war, we did produce no cars. We had even produced cars during the world, in, during the Great Depression. But we saw, Corset manufacturers making grenade belts and toy factories making compasses and all of our industries were retooled. We met those arms goals. In fact, we far exceeded them, uh, creating 20, almost 230,000 aircraft. And we did all this mobilization, not in decades, not in years, but in a matter of months. Right now, looking at climate, looking how it affects our food security and our human security, we are in a race. We're in a race between tipping points in our political systems and our social systems and in those natural systems. So the question now is, will the growing movement to stop coal-fired power plants be able to tip the point faster than the melting of the Greenland and the Antarctic ice sheets? Can we slow down climate change fast enough so that the Amazon doesn't become vulnerable to drought and likely to burn? Lester Brown says in the book Plan B, saving civilization is not a spectator sport.